the nature of true faith, it's very essential that we know whether or not we belong to the Savior. Of course, faith is a virtue that one day will pass away, and that will be when we see Christ face to face. In glory, we will see him face to face. We will no longer need to hope in what is presently unseen. Amen. Until then, however, we are called to to stake our very lives on the covenant promises of a God who is faithful. So we must affirm the truth of his word, not because of an irrational trust or wishful thinking, but because he has kept his promises in the past and will certainly do so in the future. Yes, I love it. So our format today is worship, prayer, study, comments, and questions as normal. So after you listen to the song, please type done into the room and we will get started.
Amen. What a savior we have. I was thinking those words through. He is with us to the end. And then I thought, well, now, wait a minute. There's a paradox there. there there's a mystery there because time is without end. But yet it says he is with us to the end. And then I was reminded of the words of Jesus when he says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the world, to the end of the age. What a savior, what a marvelous savior we have. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you have provided us a wonderful, gracious, faithful, loving savior. Father, that is with us, that is in us, and that is for us. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your word that you have given us that we can learn of you and know you and love you and serve you. Open our eyes and our ears to your words today that we may know you and love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a savior he is. And so here we come to Hebrews 11. And here's our scripture. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Here we see the scripture, God creating by his hand, by his word. He spoke and it came into being. And a lot of people find that very hard to believe. God sending his son to earth by a virgin birth is even more difficult for others to believe. And the fact that Jesus lived and died for our sins is impossible for many to believe. But with all this, it's even more important to know that your faith is real. Your faith is what separates you from those who will never know or never see or never experience the joy of knowing Christ. You know, I was reading a story. We've been reading lots of stories in the news about uh, about refugees and, and different people coming into the country. I read a story where three people died and 25 were injured as smugglers attempted to bring dozens of illegal immigrants into the U.S. through a boat along the coast. What happened was that the boat broke up on the reef just at a point along the San Diego coast. The boat broke into pieces and dozens of people ended up on the surf. It's just another day in the border crisis, right? You look at the Mexico border, it seems that nearly every week we hear of another disaster near the border about people dying, about, about SUVs and cars and vehicles uh, carrying 25 or more immigrants and they try to cross the border. You even hear, I've read about refrigerator trucks. Think of it, packed with immigrants in a refrigerator truck and it gets abandoned in the hot weather and many of the people die and perish of the heat. And you ask your, this question, why are people risking everything they have, enduring great dangers, the welfare of their children, and even their own lives to get into the United States? Well, it's because they believe in the promise of a new and a better life. And some are so desperate, they're willing to suffer all kinds of difficulties if they can reach the promised land. Yes, there is a border crisis in the United States, but it's not entirely unlike the Christian life of faith. It is the story of faith as we now come to what has been called the Faith Hall of Fame. And what we discover is that suffering and patient endurance is the normal pattern of a life lived by faith. 
Here we're going to read over the next couple of weeks the Faith's Hall of Fame, and it features repeatedly people who have been willing to endure great suffering in this life to obtain the better promise of a better life in time to come. Now think back, we've just completed Hebrews chapter 10. We have found the exhortation there not to throw away your confidence. Don't throw away your faith because it has a great reward. And that the righteous one will live by faith. It is the final reason why we should persevere in the faith because our faith has a great reward waiting for us that we cannot see at this time. So having explained that it's necessary for us to live by faith in order to endure, the writer now explains what it looks like now to live by faith. And he does so by describing what faith does and then providing us with inspiring examples of those who lived about such faith. Faith is the means of realizing spiritual reality of gaining God's approval and of understand the understanding the origin of everything there is. I'm going to give you three principles of faith as we go through this chapter. First principle is this. Trust is essential for close relationships. Trust is essential for close relationships. If you don't trust someone, you're not going to allow yourself to get close to that person. You're not going to share personal information because you are afraid that the person will use it in a way that damages you. The second principle for close relationships is this. Truth is the basis for trust. Truth is the basis for trust. If someone lies to you, if they deceive you, you're not going to trust what he says or does. You will always be on your guard if you sense that the person is a hypocrite conveying that he is something that he's really not, you're going to keep your distance. So a lack of truth erodes that trust and causes a distance in your relationships. Third principle for close relationships, truth must be expressed in love. Truth must be expressed in love. By love, I mean seeking the highest good of the other person. The highest good for every person is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So this motive of love must undergird all verbal expressions of truth. So these elements of relationship also to apply to our relationship with God. Faith or trust in God is at the foundation of our relationship with him. We're going to read later that without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's in verse six. Truth is the basis for trust. If you doubt the truth of God's word, including his promises for the future, you can't trust him and thus you will be distant from him. Understanding these principles, trust is essential for close relationships. Truth is the basis for trust and truth must be expressed in love, which means seeking the highest good shows why faith or trust is at the heart of the relationship with God. And we're going to look at three truths that we're going to find in these scriptures today. In verse one, faith is the means of realizing spiritual reality. I love that lady. Truth without love is brutality. Yes. Truth must be coupled with love. It's two sides of the same coin. First verse, faith is the means of realizing spiritual reality. Now, the difficulty of this verse lies in the meaning of the words translated as assurance or being certain of in the NIV, the conviction or as the KJV and the New King James translate these words, the substance and the evidence, okay? These understand the words as subjective truth, whereas the King James uh, brings out the understanding of substance, the evidence being an objective truth. 
The subjective understanding is this. Faith means confident of what we hope for, convinced of what we do not see. It applies personally to our lives, as all scripture should. An objective understanding is this. Faith means the reality of the goods hoped for, the proof of the things unseen. Another understanding might be this. In faith, things hoped for become realized or a reality or a proving of or conviction of unseen things. I'm going through all these, these word plays just to, to heighten your understanding of what this means. That if they are unseen thing, they are not yet realized, but they are certain. They are certain. They are objective truths that God will call to our minds. In other words, faith is the reality of the things hoped for. It is the reality of what's hoped for in exactly the sense in which Jesus is called the exact representation of the real reality of the descendant God. It is real. It hasn't been seen. It hasn't been realized, but it is as good and as real as the computer you're looking into right now. It's as real as this life. And it is certain because it's based on better promises and it will come to pass. I'm going to give you a quote from Donald Hagner, wrote a book called Encountering the Book of Hebrews. From this verse, he said, from the examples of faith lifted up in this chapter, it seems clear that what is not primarily in view is what we feel or possess assurance, confidence, but rather how faith substantiates or gives substance to what is promised, how it provides evidence of what is believed about unseen and hoped for realities. Faith indeed has a way of making the future present and the unseen visible. I love that. It makes the future present and the unseen visible because we see it with our eyes of faith. Our faith substantiates what we hope for, thus giving us the assurance that they are true. Faith proves or gives evidence for the things that we cannot see, thus giving us a conviction that these unseen things are real and true and actual. Faith makes real in our experiences the promises that God has given about the future. Faith proves to us the fact that the things we presently cannot see. Let me give you a few examples. God, angels, demons, heaven, hell. These are things we cannot see with our fleshly eyes, but they are very much true and very much real. In other words, Faith applies the realities of God's promises and the unseen world to the life in the present visible world. We apply those lessons of faith to this world and we trust and we hold on to those promises. And that's what he's saying here. Our faith is a faith centered on a better future. No, as one writer has said, this is not your best life now. If this is my best life now, I'll put a gun to my head, throw in the towel, and give up. Our faith is a faith not based on this life here and now. It's based and centered on a better future. It isn't primarily the promise of a better life here and now, Though that is true in many ways. We do have confidence. We have faith. We have goodness. We have an abundant life in Jesus Christ. That's all true. But it's a primarily a promise of a better life in the future, of eternal life in the future that has drawn us to Jesus Christ. And he is saying that promise of a better future needs to be our focus when we experience difficult times as Christians, even because we are Christians in this life, in this body right now. So our perspective must be an eternal perspective, looking to the things that are not seen. 
So if we want to endure in the faith, we must walk by faith in what is unseen, what we hope for rather than in accord with what is seen and experience. If we focus on what is seen and what we experience here, well, then persevering in the faith is going to be a real challenge. If we focus on the better things to come, then even as those who attempt to cross the border will be willing to suffer in the meantime because the hope of a better future is so great. This is the kind of faith that has always been how people please God. You live by faith, a faith that is willing to suffer now, to experience glory later, because this kind of faith has always been what distinguished the people of God from those who weren't. George Mueller, you're familiar with his work, was another man who made God's promises real by faith. He uh, And he proved in a visible, visible way the reality of the invisible God. He literally gave away all his money, all his possessions, and by faith found in an orphanage in Bristol, England. Eventually, the orphanage grew to 2,000 children who needed food, clothing, and shelter every day. Mueller had no savings account and he refused to make the needs of his ministry known, even to potential donors. He wanted to prove to the world that there is reality in dealing with the living God. And he saw thousands of specific answers to prayer, which he carefully and recorded later and published in his works. Later, he would write these words concerning his story. It is the very time for faith to work when sight ceases. The greater the difficulties, the easier for faith. As long as there remain certain natural prospects, faith does not get on e even as easily, if I may say so, as when all natural prospects fail. What an amazing testimony to the faithfulness of God. Moving on to verse 2. Verse 2 tells us that faith is the means of gaining God's approval. The clear implica implication is that the approval comes from God, as the rest of the chapter shows. The world often ridicules or despises the person who lives by faith. We need to recognize that faith is not a meritorious work that we do to gain rewards from God that would conflict with the entire teaching of the New Testament that faith is simply the channel through which God's blessings flow. Two seemingly paradoxical things are true of faith. First, on one hand, it is our responsibility to believe the gospel because God commands us to believe. He says, Jesus says in Mark, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, that's in the imperative, repent and believe the gospel. We are called, we are commanded to repent. It is a command, we are called to repent. On the other hand, sinners are unable to believe because of spiritual blindness. Saving faith comes as God's gift, not as a human effort. Ephesians clearly tells us that we were dead in our sins and unable and unwilling to come to Christ in faith. Jesus is both the author and the perfecter of faith. Good works flow from saving faith as the source and give proof to genuine faith. So both faith and works come from God. And Christ's sacrifice on the cross is the only basis for the forgiveness of sins. He said clearly, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We cannot even gain God's approval by putting our trust in Christ alone as our only hope of heaven. This is all a gift from God. He is the one who grants the faith necessary to believe. We can't hope in our good works because all the good works in the world can never erase 
the debt of sin you owe. Don't hope in your faith because it, faith in your faith can't save you. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. He will save all that come to him by faith. So we who have trusted in Christ as Savior, we learn to live each day to seek his pleasure and his approval. While we should never be needlessly offensive toward people, our focus should not be on pleasing people, but our focus should be on pleasing God. In Thessalonians, Paul writes, our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests the heart. So we live to please God, and you know his peace, even if people angrily oppose you. And they will. They will oppose you, and they will do it angrily. So faith is the means of realizing spiritual reality and gaining God's approval. Third point comes in verse three. That is, faith is the means of understanding the origin of all that is. The word universe here can mean the ages. It's an actual Greek word uh, the, from which we get our word eon, E-O-M, from. Hebrews, by faith, we understand that the universe, that the ages or the eons was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are invisible. Ages or worlds is a Hebrew way of referring to the creation from the standpoint of its successive duration. Uh, while the term here is roughly equivalent to our world world, it allows for what modern science has established that time is related to matter. The author says that faith gives us understanding of how the material universe and how time came into being, namely by God's spoken word. Matter is not eternally. Matter is not eternal. God, who is spirit, is eternal. So the eternal God brought physical matter and time into being by his powerful word alone. And he brought it into being out of nothing. You can only understand that by faith. No one was there to observe it or to record it. The prevailing current worldview that matter has always existed and that the current universe, including man, happened by sheer chance over billions of years, that's based on blind faith. I remember reading a book, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, and that is so true. I don't have the faith that would, that would be necessary to believe what they believe because there's no evidence to support it. The biblical view, that is the, the, uh, the eternal God spoke it into existence, is based on faith, but not on blind faith. There is abundant evidence that an incredibly intelligent designer created everything, especially human life. You would think that a discovery such as human DNA would show amazingly amazing design would cause all the scientists to fall down in worship before God. But it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, we read in Romans, why? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts are darkened, claiming to be wise. They become fools and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds 
and animals and creeping things. Yes, psalmists, uh, great minds think alike. We were thinking of the same verse. So they are truth suppressors. They suppress the truth for unrighteousness. They become futile in their speculations. Their foolish hearts are darkened and professing to be wise, they become fools. There's only one thing that changes a truth suppressor into a truth seeker, and that is the gift of faith that God has given us. We no longer suppress the truth. We seek it because God's word is truth. He sanctifies us by his truth, and we search for it daily in his word. So faith in God as creator is foundational to knowing God. The fact that the author puts verse three at the start of his list by faith examples, proves that faith in God as creator is foundational to knowing him personally. The first verse of the Bible hits us squarely with a vital fact. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You cannot begin to understand yourself, other people, world history, or God if you reject the early chapters of Genesis or if you refer to the early chapters of Genesis as merely a myth or a narrative or a story. The first verse of Genesis presents you with a crucial choice. And here is your choice. If God created everything, that is, then he is the sovereign of the universe. If you do not come to him in faith as your savior, you will stand before him in terror as your judge. But when you believe in his word about salvation, you gain understanding about the origins of the ages that makes everything in history fall into place. Three facts of historical redemption we must receive and believe by faith. That is creation, the fall, and redemption. Creation, how did we get here? The fall, what went wrong with humanity? And redemption, what is the solution for our deep problem of sin? how and why God brought all things into being, what went wrong with his perfect creation, and what is the solution to that wrong. These three historical facts bind all of history into a glorious story of a covenant and faithful God working to redeem a people for himself. And remember the Emmanuel principle, he is our God and we are his people. Yes, and I agree, Psalmist, presuppositional. I'm a big Van Til fan. You didn't already know that. Just a couple conclusions to close us out. First conclusion is this. The author does not want us to have a temporary, shaky, and unstable faith that shrinks back to destruction. He wants us to have a faith that endures trials. He wants us to have a faith that endures persecution, the preserving of the soul. Think about these Hebrews that he was writing to. They were already facing persecution. And remember what we read from chapter 10 last week. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Why are we not of those who shrink back it's because God is preserving our souls. He is holding us in the palm of his hand and he will complete what he has begun. Such faith takes the future promises of God and makes them real in the present. It proves the reality of the unseen world and it gains God's approval. It understands the origin of all that there is. Second conclusion. Such faith, as we will see in the numerous examples as we go through Hebrews chapter 11, is very down to earth and practical. This faith has sustained the people of God through thousands of years in every sort of difficulty that your mind can even imagine. 
and saints of God, ladies and gentlemen, it will sustain you in the trials that you face right now. Trust in God and you need never fear. Put your confidence, your faith, your hope in Christ Jesus. Put your confidence in his promises of that unrealized, unseen world. Put your confidence in his person and his work. You will never be disappointed and you will never shrink back because his mercies are new every morning. Amen. Amen. Well, I tested out the piano and I have a song I attempted to play for you last time. Uh, I put the words up here. Uh, let me put that. On. So if you want to sing along, I'm going to test it once again. You heard that? Okay. And I will close this in prayer when I am done. Jesus shines brighter, Jesus shines purer than all the angels heaven. <laughs> Violinist, you are you are a nut. <laughs> I love it. And the last phrase, glory and honor, praise adoration, now and forevermore be thine. Yes, Nanny Dove, please share. Did you want do you want to have the mic, Nanny? Okay, go ahead.
Amen. Yes, we do need faith now, and it's God who gives it to us. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Father, that you are a gracious, heavenly, merciful God who loves us, who calls us, who gives us the faith to know you, to love you, and to serve you, Lord, with all our heart. We trust in you. We look forward to the future where we will shed this earthly body and come into your presence to know you and see you face to face. And we'll sing with the saints, glory and honor, praise, adoration, now and forevermore is yours. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen, Nanny. He is. You will see him again. Bless you all. Thank you for coming. And I'll see you around.